Today's scripture will be 2 Samuel 14, 1 through 33, and I will be reading only 1 through 3. Now Joab, son of Zevariah, perceived that the king's mind was on Absalom. Jehovah went to Tekoa and brought there from the wise woman. He said to her, Pretend to be a mourner, put your mourning garments. Do not appoint yourself with oil, but have like a woman who has been mourning day, many days for the dead. Go to the king and speak to him as follows. And Joab put the words in her mouth. Thank you. You may be seated. Bible, a book at a time, a chapter at a time. And you just got lucky enough to get here when we're doing 2 Samuel 14. And uh, some of these chapters are, are fun, exciting stuff. Today's not one of those. So uh, I'm going to ask you at the end of the time what spiritual lessons we learn. And so you can uh, help, me, help us all out you know, by giving your wisdom, especially Marjorie's full of wisdom. So we'll take the wisdom. So last week... Absalom left Jerusalem. He, he had killed his brother, and he left Jerusalem, and he was gone for three years. Does anybody remember what David was doing while Absalom was gone? I know this is tough. I remember a week ago. David was yearning for Absalom. So David's walking around dejected, thinking about his son, thinking about all the things that have happened, and he just can't concentrate. He can't do his job because he's thinking about his loss. Right? So that's, that's what David was doing. So Joab is his, his chief uh, general in his army. Joab is seeing this in David, and he says, this isn't good. We can't have this. you gotta, you got to snap out of this, David. So Joab comes up with his plan, and he goes and finds this woman, and he teaches her what to say, and he, and he tells her to put on mourning clothes, and mourning as in loss lost of husband clothes, and come, go to David. So Joab put the words into her mouth. Now also... Uh, Brenda and Marjorie, I don't give you the whole verse, so you'll have to, if you have a Bible, you can follow along and see where we're at. But uh, I pick out part of it, and then we go from there. So David was obviously troubled by Absalom's ab absence, and Joab decided to do something. Now, we can, we can uh, argue or, or discuss what he did and what, whether that was good or not, and we'll find that out next week, that, that it wasn't good. But today we think it's good. So the woman uh, came to the king, and she tells her family story that, that, of course, Joab gave her the family story. And the family story is that she's a widow, she's got two sons, and one of her sons killed the other son. Now, as you might remember from the, the rules, the Jewish rules is that if, if you kill someone, then they send a, a uh, and I can't think of the right term, but they send a uh, person to kill you. So it's, a, it's like a judge kind of thing, and they, they just judge you and they send someone to kill you because you killed somebody else. So uh, normally you can, if it's an accidental death, you can go to a city of refuge and stay there until the trial and you won't get killed until they find you guilty and then they'll kill you. But if it's an accident or something, you have a chance. But if you kill someone, then somebody's going to come and kill you. So that's the story she tells David. And 
she asked David, please may the king keep the Lord your God in mind so that the avenger, that's what it is, avenger of blood, may kill no more and my son may not be destroyed. So David hears this sad story and he's a good guy and he, he believes her, of course, and he says, don't worry about it. We will protect your son. Nobody's going to kill him. And she goes on, let your servant speak a word to my lord, your king. So she presses David further, and she says, we need to apply that to you and your son Absalom, who killed his brother Amnon. And so it's a trick, you know, she tricked him into uh, uh, giving a good judgment on Absalom, that's what it is. And, and David is caught, you know. He's already said, no, you shouldn't kill the son. And that he's, what he's really, now he can't kill his own son. So he's bound to restore the absent Absalom. And the, the widow is in a way representing the nation Israel. Absalom was very popular with the people. And they probably felt like Amnon, who raped his sister, that Amnon got what he deserved. So Absalom was good for what he did, and he should be brought back, the, the, the nation Israel. And the nation also was worried about David and the successor, which would be Absalom. So uh, the nation is, is worried about this and wants Absalom to come back also. And she's representing the nation at that point. And then in her, in her word she says, God will not take away a life. He will devise plans. He will devise a way for you if you are in judgment. But not at the expense of justice. God will give you a way, but not at, a, at the expense of justice. God reconciles us by satisfying justice, not ignoring justice. So how is that? How did God make a way to satisfy justice without ignoring it? Anybody want to take a wild guess? If you've heard me say this before, this is the Sunday school answer. You can always say this and have the right answer. Jesus. Donna said Jesus. Jesus, yes, that's the Sunday school answer. You can always say Jesus and, and pretty much answer any question in Sunday school. Jesus. All right, Doug. Doug got it too. The way back is through the work of Jesus, how he took the place of sinners as he hung on the cross and received the punishment that we deserve. That's the way God satisfies justice without ignoring justice. We all deserve death. God made a way to life. The word of my Lord the King will set me at rest, for my Lord the King is like the angel of God. Now, I, you know, here the lady is just buttering up the king. She's just saying something nice so that, that uh, she, he won't get mad at her, I guess, or something. And then the king says, did Joab have something to do with this? And she said, yeah. Somehow David knew that Joab had this subtle way of sneaking in here and, and, and do that. So I don't know if, king, if Joab was sitting in the background when all this happened, but the king turns to Joab and says, very well, I grant you this. Go and bring back the young man, Absalom. But he's only half-heartedly telling them to bring back Absalom. Now Joab thought he was doing what was right for the nation. And he hoped that this reconciliation with Absalom would save the nation and in fact would maybe stop a rebellion. Now we'll, we'll get into that next week but Absalom is so loved by the people that there is fear in Joab's mind that Absalom would, would start a rebellion from afar 
And if you come back and you reconcile with David, everything would be all right, and the nation would be whole. So we'll find out about that next week. So David says, okay, he can come back, but let him go to his own house. He is not to come into my presence. Now, does that sound like forgiveness? Does that sound like it's over? If he's going to come, he can come back into town. Just stay away from me. But that's what he said. And he allowed him to come back in spite of the fact that Absalom is unrepentant. So now Israel, in all Israel, there's no one to be praised so much for his beauty as Absalom. From the sole of his feet to the crown of his head, there was no blemish on, in him. And if you want to read the rest of that, it says how pretty he is. He's got beautiful hair. Um, and that hair gets him in trouble later, but right now everybody says, oh, Absalom. Just like, just like Brenda, Bruce says, just like Brenda. So, so why, did he, why did this chapter have this verse in it about how pretty Absalom is? Well, that will come into play in the next chapter. But it's just, it's just right there that that's there. So, Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem without seeing his dad. Two years. And, and he tried and tried to get into the dad, but um, he couldn't get in to see him. Joab kept him away. So we can imagine that Absalom, over these two years, is growing more and more bitter towards his dad, who is keeping him away. Absalom, for his part, he felt justified in killing his half-brother Amnon because of what Amnon had done. So that sense that he was just in what he did would make the bitterness against David more intense. You know, he's thinking, David is blaming me and I did what was right. So, Absalom's in this place where there's a field and next to, the, next to where he lives is where Joab lives. And Joab has a field of uh, barley. And he can't get Joab's attention. He keeps calling out to Joab, let me see my dad, let me see my dad, and he wouldn't do it. So what did Joab did, do? No, what did Absalom do? He set the field on fire. <laughs> That'll get his attention. He set the field on fire. Well, what that shows is how brutal and amoral Absalom was. He will do anything he feels like. Now, consider the contrast between uh, Kinsey, our prodigal child, and Absalom. When Kinsey left and wanted to come back, she was repentant. I'm sorry, Dad. Take me back. Absalom wasn't sorry. He came back proud. And we can see the seeds of rebellion in Absalom even here. He took, took matters in his own hands no matter what. He killed his half-brother and now he set this field on fire. And dad never did anything about it. So he says to Joab, why have I come from Geshur, which is where he was at for those three years? It would be better for me to stay, for me to still be there. Now set, let me go into the king's presence. If there is guilt in me, let him kill me. So this statement reflects the fact that Absalom felt justified in what he did. So then... Joab went to the king and told him, and he summoned Absalom. So he came to the king and prostrated himself with his face to the ground before the king, and the king kissed Absalom. Now you're supposed to read from this. He's coming in, he's begging for mercy, and the king kisses him, and everything is all right. 
right? Everything is fine. Well, David accepted Absalom without any repentance and without any resolution of the wrong that occurred. Now, if you were here last week, you would have got this part. There was a, there's a biblical way that David could have handled Absalom for what he did. And also there's a biblical way David could have handled Amnon for what he did. And David didn't do any of that. He just kind of ignored his kids and let them do whatever they wanted to do. So David's forgiveness of Absalom was completely inadequate and it led to further sins on Absalom's part. So what should he have done? What should have David do in this case when Absalom came back? All you wise parents and grandparents especially should know this. What should he have done? Punish him? Forgiven him? We don't, I'm not saying I know the right answer. But in either one of those cases, it would have given Absalom a sense that he cares. I mean, when somebody punishes you, they do that because they care, right? Or that should be why they do it. And if they forgive you, it's because they care. David didn't do either one of those things. He just kissed him and said, ah, everything's all right. Well, if you don't talk about something, it doesn't go away. Ken, I see a big difference between this and a prodigal son. They talk about this morning. The attitude difference between a prodigal son and Absalom. Yeah, a huge difference. So God, when David sinned, did God half-heartedly forgive him? This is going back to... Um, Bathsheba. Did, they, did God say, ah, okay, whatever? He didn't. He condemned him, but he spared him from death, but he killed the son of him and Bathsheba. And he gave a, a specific punishment. He said, you're going to have trouble with your family from here on, which this is part of that. But David, or God, by doing that, it gave David a sense that God cares and God gave a specific punishment so he knows what's going on and he could get back to his relationship with God. But David didn't do that with Absalom. God did not say, well, I forgive you, but we will not have fellowship anymore. anymore. I will not restore to you the joy of your salvation. What what salvation means from Christ with us is that we can have this relationship with God. If we don't have that relationship, we're lost, we're on our own. But now with that, we can go to God and say, hey, God, I'm sorry, I messed up, I keep messing up, help me out. And God will help us out. So when God forgives, he forgives completely. Now you and I are admonished to Ephesians 4, 31 to 32, put away from you all bitterness and wrath and anger and wrangling and slander together with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as Christ, or God in Christ has forgiven you. What's it say in the Lord's Prayer? Anybody remember what it says in the Lord's Prayer about forgiveness? Forgive our trespasses. Forgive our debtors. Forgive as, you've forgive as you have been forgiven. And then there's right after the Lord's Prayer that re, it reemphasizes that. And, and there's parables that Dwayne's been talking about parables downstairs. There's parables that Jesus gives, and what, about the parable about the guy that owns owes billions of dollars. There's no way he can pay it, and the guy forgives him. And then what's he go out and do? He goes out and chokes the guy that owes him 20 bucks. And he throws him in jail because he didn't pay. And then when the 
when the parable guy finds out about that, he says, I forgave you billions of dollars and you can't forgive 20 bucks? And then he throws him in jail. That's what God does for us. If we can't forgive others, we are in trouble. It means we haven't realized the forgiveness God has for us. David should have forgiven Absalom, and he didn't. And he's setting a further stage for rebellion. If anyone is detected in transgression, you who have received the Spirit should restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness. Take care that you yourself are not tempted. David has received this forgiveness. He should restore or work towards restoring Absalom. But he didn't. He just, he just kissed him sort of like you, if you kissed your own sister or something and I don't want anything to do with you. Okay, now the hard part. What spiritual, I mean, okay, it's a good story. We could make a soap opera, right? But that doesn't do us any good. We need a spiritual lesson for us to take home with us to help us in our lives. So what spiritual lesson, what spiritual insight can we pull out of this story? See, I ask hard questions. And, and since you're here, you have to answer them. Nobody else will, so. You have to forgive others sometimes even though they haven't asked you for forgiveness so that God will forgive you forgive you. Did you hear what Brenda said? Sometimes you may have to forgive someone even though they're not repentant. Because who does it hurt when you don't forgive? It hurts us. And then that person probably doesn't care. But, but it matters. The relationship between you and God is dependent on that forgiveness from you. Now, that doesn't mean you have to go and hug that person. You've got to protect yourself from that person if they've hurt you. But you can still forgive them. Half forgiveness is no forgiveness. Half forgiveness is no forgiveness. Half? Half okay. forgiveness, yeah. which is no forgiveness at all. Yeah, half forgiveness. If you only halfway do it, then you really haven't forgiven. <clears throat> okay, I got another one. David and Joab had been together for many years. Joab was with, with that army that... that uh, David formed when he was uh, running from Saul. That's how far him and Joab go back. <clears throat> Joab was stepping in to help someone who couldn't see their own problems. David was blinded by his own sin. That's what we've been saying. He's blinded. Even though he's forgiven by God, he, he's just blinded and can't see what's going on around him. So Joab steps in to help him see something he can't see himself. You need a relationship with someone in order to properly help them in the future. Nathan had the same thing. Nathan was actually from that same time period as when Nathan, or David saved Nathan because somebody killed all the other uh, priests. Nathan was David's personal priest that went around with him. And we, we always had David asking Nathan, what should I do here? And what does God want me to do? And then Nathan would tell David, and David would do it. Well, after the time of Bathsheba, David wasn't going to Nathan. Because Nathan had confronted him, and he wasn't going back to him. Now, maybe later he'll get back together, but we don't hear David talking to Nathan. Nathan sh David should have went to Nathan and said, what do I do with Absalom? But he didn't. But what I'm getting at is the, Na the, the relationship that Nathan had with David allowed him to confront David with the sin of Bathsheba. We need to work at having a relationship with somebody before we, con we uh, condemn them or, or try to convict them or 
connect with them, confront them, sorry. So it's those relationships that help us. So if you see somebody on the street uh, and, and you know they think you need help, you can't just go up to them and start yelling at them. Now, we, we have, I have a story. My, my uh, co-worker, we got a job in Piqua, and he went to the job, and he parked his truck right in front of a sign that said, Alley Closed. So it's, it's a Piqua Y. They closed the alley to work on the, the PIC, on the YMCA. So my guy parks right in front of that sign. A Karen, you know what a Karen is? I don't know if you know what a Karen is. A Karen came up to him and just started yelling for 20 minutes about him parking his truck in the alley. He had no idea who she was. She had no idea who he was. But he just yelled and yelled and yelled about him parking this truck. And he's saying, hey, I just, this is my first day here. I don't know anything about this job, this relationship. The sign says the alley is closed. I'm only going to be here five minutes. But, but she would not let up on him. And, and we still don't know why he was yelling. It's not like he was blocking the alley or anything. And he just yelled at yell. And finally, she said, I'm going to call the why, I'm going to call everybody up. And he said, okay, you know, go ahead. I'll, I'm going to move my truck. Okay, but she didn't have a relationship. If, what should she have done? She could have come up and said, hey, you know, I, I know you're just, or I don't know who you are, but your truck's not in a good place. And he would have. Now, if he'd have said, forget you, lady, you know, I'm not listening to you, then she could have yelled at him. But to just go up and start yelling at somebody without a relationship is not going to do any good. It didn't, it didn't do my guy any good. And it's not going to do any good in our lives. That's why when we want to evangelize, what do we do? We try to work out a relationship. You can at least say, hey, what's going on in your life? Or, or what's your occupation? You know, or something to get something started before you just lay into somebody. So, work, if you want to confront somebody, work at some kind of relationship first. So homecoming should be a joyous thing, but it's not always a joyous thing. Like we said, Absalom came home proud and unrepentant. And, of course, we compare that to the prodigal son who came home repentant, or Kinsey came home repentant in the skit. Should David have forgiven Absalom? Well, and how should that have happened? Well, he could at least acknowledge that he's here and acknowledge what happened. Acknowledge that he killed his brother and the law says that we should kill you but God forgave me with Bathsheba. I can forgive you. That would be a starting point. It's something he could have done. Let's set up this relationship so we can talk to each other. Now I'll throw in something that, that you've all heard of, or most of you have heard of. Several years ago, somebody went on to the Amish community and, and went into the Amish school and killed a bunch of children. Anybody remember that? And what did the Amish people do when that happened? They forgave him. They invited him. I, I don't remember that part, but they invited the, the guy to their community. How could you do that? Because the guy's probably not repentant, right? How, how, why would you do that? How could you do that? It would be tough. It would be tough. It's your children. He just, he just killed your children. It's where your pure heart comes in. It's where your pure heart comes in. What, and we can't say that the Amish are any better than us. Maybe they're a little closer to God than we are. 
Maybe not. And we don't know what the, what the Lord's plans are. We don't know what the Lord's plans are. Right. Uh, now, if we, if we want to step back in the upper story part, which, which Dwayne would tell us to do, we can know that those children are where? They're in heaven. So in, in terms of our Christian faith, we can know that those children, they're in a better place. We've got to slug it out in this tough old world, and they don't. But what will hurt us in this world is that pain in this heart if we carry unforgiveness. Now the other part we know, they know, is that man is going to be punished for what he did. All the forgiveness in the world is not going to stop him from being punished. So they know that. So it's not like they're setting him free from punishment. They're just setting him free to see the love of God, which he may never have seen before. That's what we want people to see in us. The love of God. Right? Was that, did you get a call from God? So Dwayne is saying it's not always easy to interweave our lower story with God's upper story. Well, we know as Christians that we are part of that upper story whether we realize it or not. But it's not easy for us to get in a situation like that and say, oh God, I, this is your story. We're just going to go with it. Because we've got this hurt. We've got whatever is in our heart to fight against also. But in, in the bigger picture, we can know that God has an upper story we just don't like. Yeah, we, we don't understand. What the media thought, the world. See, the world says take vengeance, hate, kill. Yeah. You wonder what message. They probably couldn't understand how the honor can say, we forgive them, versus we will take retribution on this. So you've got the media also like, this don't make sense. So for those of you who are watching at home, Dwayne is saying that, that the world doesn't understand the Christian aspect. And when the media started putting this story out, everybody was going, wait a minute, how can you do that? What's going on? And if you remember that time, there was a big buzz in the news for months because people don't understand and even, even us Christians had a hard time understanding. Which just shows how much more we need to seek God's face and, and seek wisdom from God. We are to forgive as we have been forgiven. And if you've been forgiven, if you're a child of God... You know that your past, your sins, are, in, in God's eyes, are as bad as that guy that killed the Amish girls. Or as bad as Absalom that killed his brother. Our sins, in God's eyes, those sins are just as bad. So, with that in mind, the fact that God forgave us should give us the power to forgive others. And then we can trust Jesus to take it from there. Let's pray. God, we love you. We love the fact that you can forgive us, forgive our past, forgive our mistakes, and invite us through Jesus to come home. Thank you. Amen. Our last song is Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. <laughs>